Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm honored to be the first uh, uh, lecturer on this, uh, for this uh, global summer school. Today, I'm going to talk about China's innovation system, myths and reality. Let me see. Okay, let me, I, I think, first start by just giving some general introduction of why I selected this topic. I think we all know that in recent years, China has been making progress in promoting innovation-driven development which has generated some concerns in the U.S. Uh, and, and China is viewed as a, a threat to the U.S. dominance in science, technology, and innovation. I think tr further, I think China was charged to have achieved this progress through intellectual safety and, uh, and, and forced technology transfer. I think the latest uh, attack you know, came from the U.S. Attorney G General, William Barr, I think actually just a few days ago now in uh, his address at the General Ford uh, Presidential Mu Museum in Michigan. I think that sort of the, in a way, um, uh, shows the, uh, the kind, you know, of course, I think many of these charts, we basically, you know, there's a little evidence provided. And, and, uh, and all, you know, I think, particularly, I think, you know, with many of the hypes and, and um, accusations on the newspapers and so on, people are really confused about the reality. Uh, you know, what, what really uh, China progress has China made? And through what ways has China, uh, um, uh, used to make this progress, and also, you know, uh, what's the prospect uh, of China continuing that progress? So I think that based on, you know, this observation, so in, in this presentation, I wanted to try to examine this issue in the overall context of China's overall reform and openness in the last 40 years by really reviewing the evolution of China's innovation systems, really assessing the progress and regress in China's innovation system, and also reflect on what can be learned from, uh, can we learn from for future development. So let me first start by the, giving the general context of China's uh, innovation system uh, in, in terms of particularly the change over the last 40 years. I, see, I think this general context is China's 40 years reform and openness. I think over the last 40 years and since uh, uh, 1978, basically I think China has experienced four major transformations. The first one is e economic system, from a planning system to a market-based uh, economic system. A and the outcome of that is the a rapid uh, uh, you know, economic growth, as we see that before the 2008 uh, economic crisis, averaging about 10% uh, uh, each year. And uh, but still, I think after the, the crisis, it's still 6 to 7%. Uh, percent. The second major change is the industrial structure. Uh, Chinese uh, economy was uh, making a major transition from agriculture and manufacturing based to increasingly a manufacturing and service based uh, uh, industry. You can see, as you can see that at the beginning of the, uh, the reform, agriculture uh, is about 30% of China's GDP and labor actually is more than two thirds. But now I think the uh, Chinese agriculture is only about 8%. Uh, of, of China's GDP and the less than one third in labor. However, the service, uh, you know, in the, at the beginning of the re reform, is only about 20 percent, but now it's over more than uh, uh, it's more than a half of China's GDP. So that's sort of the second change. I think the third major change is societal change. I think you can see that uh, Chinese society is really making a major transition from a closed rural society to an increasingly urban and open society. Uh, urban population uh, increased rapidly from about 20% in 1982, the beginning of the reform, to now more than uh, uh, close to 60% uh, in, in, uh, uh, of the all to total population. And also, I think the, there's many ways in terms of the, uh, the economy and the society has been opening in terms of the economic self-reliance, from the economic self-reliance to the largest trading partner in the world. I think if you look at the, uh, the, the trade data and the FDI data, it all shows uh, rapid growth. International trade in, in 1978 is only about 10% of China's GDP, and uh, you know, it, it gets to as high as 65% in 2006, and now it, you know, it re returned, uh, declined a bit to about uh, 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 close to 40%. So I think that's sort of the really, in, on the economic side, but also in terms of the uh, general uh, people's access to, inter to internet, China is uh, now probably 
has the world's largest uh, population and with access to, in, uh, to internet, and overseas travel also increased rapidly uh, from 2000, 2000 um, uh, in the year 2000, uh, with about uh, 10 million people, now uh, to in 2017, uh, uh, you know, 100 uh, to accurate to, uh, 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 you know, one 1,300 million uh, uh, people, uh, three 1,000. Probably, I think there's one one more zero. I think it's um, to 130 million people. So I think that's a, a very rapid increase in terms of overseas travel. So I think that all shows Chinese uh, 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 society, society has been changing, the, the change that happened in Chinese society. The last one is major transformations on the governance. It's the Chinese governance is changing from a charisma and authority-based one to an increasingly based on participation and rule of law. I think that uh, the Chinese uh, government has um, uh, uh, made a very clear, uh, uh, you know, uh, determination to to uh, to establish a clean and capable government. Uh, China has experienced eight major reforms, uh, administrative reforms, and also expanded, uh, you know, public service very rapidly, uh, providing the um, uh, the the you know sort of the for a free basic education in in 1986, uh, social security system established in 1990s, and and uh, uh, a universal health system in 2009. And also, China has um, launched a major anti-corruption um, uh, effort uh, since uh, 2012. And I think, uh, as you can see, the number of um, high-ranking officials being uh, indicted you know, are, are quite uh, uh, staggering. And also, China has made a lot of effort in, in building a vibrant uh, society and uh, reforming the legal system. So all of those major changes um, in terms of the um, the economic system, industrial structure, social change, and the governance system change. That's really providing the general context of China's innovation system reform. So I think that's what uh, I'm going to now focus on. Okay. I think it's, you know, against that background, I think China's innovation system has also uh, uh, under uh, you know gone through uh, a, a very a very major uh, transformation, but I think before I, I get to the major transformation since 1978, I wanted to bring us back to 1895. That's where I see as the beginning of a contemporary education and research system. That's sort of the, really the foundation of the innovation system. I think until after Open War, China began to send students to the West to learn modern science and technology. But not until uh, the 1895, uh, China began to start its first modern university in China, which actually was uh, in Tianjin City, the Tianjin Pei, uh, Peiyang uh, Western School. So that really uh, began China's effort to build a, a modern uh, innovation system. Since then, I think the modern university system has began to grow very rapidly, despite the chaos and wars in China from 1985 to 1949. Uh, by, the, uh, by 1948, right before the funding of the People's Republic, China had uh, 100, 110 universities, including some technical colleges, and with uh, uh, over 150,000 students. So some are uh, national universities, Others are provincial and also private universities. And actually, I think one thing I want to mention is that uh, even during the World War II, I think the main leading universities, they actually had to relocate to the uh, southwest part of China, but they continued their study and they continued their education and research. Uh, and the, the picture shown, uh, the, the picture below was one of the, the so-called the um, Southwestern uh, Union University uh, which is a joint effort by Tsinghua, Peking University, and Nankai University. Also, I think during the, uh, uh, you know, the sort of Mingko area, I think before the 1949, China also has started uh, its research uh, institutions. Academic Seneca was established in June 1928 with uh, Mr. Tsai Yuanpei serving as the president, and, um, and also by uh, 1948, and there were, um, uh, you know, many, there were 81 fellows in, in academia, uh, academia, academia Sinica. And also, there are many 
research institutions except before 1949. And, and the picture shown, I think the, uh, the top one was the uh, appointment uh, plaque for, for uh, Mr. Tsai Yuanpei, and the, the picture on, on the uh, uh, dance, uh, uh, on the bottom corner is the, um, the old uh, building of the uh, academic cynica. After the funding of People's Republic of China in 1949, uh, China actually uh, uh, focused, uh, spent a lot of effort in rebuilding a, a new system, uh, uh, an innovation system, to catch up. First of all, I think that uh, uh, in, uh, in November 1949, China established the Chinese Academy of Sciences and then established many applied research institutes in various industries and in different provinces and the major municipalities. And the university system has also gone through some major restructuring. Um, many uh, uh, single discipline technical institutions were created to provide uh, training for uh, engineers to meet the demand of the industrialization uh, that's happening in China. Also, I think the uh, all universities became public and the humanities and social science were really, I think, uh, uh, reduced uh, 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 quite a lot. And also you see that the universities have went through some cycles and boom and the bust uh, from, um, 1940, uh, from, from uh, 1949 to uh, late 1970s. Industrial technology and innovation is something that uh, was really uh, uh, quite challenging for China. I think prior to 1949, China was really relying on imports from the Western countries. And then after the funding of People's Republic of China in 1949, relying on the imports from the former Soviet Union. And so you, you, know, you, you can see from the picture that um, uh, in mid 1950s, uh, China and Soviet Union uh, signed an agreement to introduce major industrial technologies to China. Uh, I said that that's the top picture. And the bottom two pictures was you know, what, some of the, the projects that's being introduced. Through this period of time that from uh, 1949 to, to the 1960s, China has achieved major progress in, in uh, establishing its uh, innovation system. Uh, by 1965, China established the more than 1,700 1, research institutes uh, with over 150,000 researchers and achieved some major progress in basic research, strategic research, and industrial technologies. So some of the, the, you know, the pictures shown here are some of those outcomes. At the same time that we also see some major s setbacks. Uh, one setback is the, uh, the breakup with uh, the, the Soviet Uni Union uh, in, in 1960, uh, the Soviet Union uh, decided to um, break up with, Ch with China on S&T collaboration, uh, basically calling back all of their experts and stopping all the joint projects. So this setback left a very strong scar in Chinese innovation system and forced China to shift to a system of so-called self-reliance. Another setback, of course, is the uh, Cultural Revolution uh, from 1966 to 1976, which actually forced almost all of China's S&T institutions to close down and engage in political movements. So that is the sort of the first sort of period of time that from 1895 to 1978 that you know laid the foundation of China's innovation system, uh, and I think that's you know so for for the uh, 40 years of reform that really served as a very important foundation. Now let's begin uh, from the second uh, period of time, the spring of science in, uh, uh, starting in 1978. Uh, this is the end of the Cultural Revolution and China had a major national science conference that really uh, restored the dual role of science and scientists in Chinese society. And the Chinese innovation system began to restore its normal operations. So that's the sort of first period after the China's reform. However, I think the, uh, what we see is that uh, in mid-1980s, uh, Chinese society has making major changes in, in terms of reform and openness. So in a way, the traditional academic institutions, they are um, still you know, doing their own work in, in their research institutes, but not 
they, they do not have much, uh, uh, um, they, first of all, there's no need for them, and they also there's not much willingness for them to serve to the need of the economic development. So how do you change the culture and the uh, incentives to let this, in, you know, s and institutions to serve for the need of the economic development? And that's sort of the, uh, the background of the first reform. So the reform strategy is that the China um, issue, the government issued a major re reform policy focused on public research institutes, basically to cut their uh, block funding and set up competitive R&D programs and to force them to really respond to the need of the economic development. Also, uh, many high-tech development zones were set up to promote innovation uh, and to promote science, technology, and innovation development. And also, scientists were encouraged to jump into the sea to become entrepreneurs. So, so this is a, a major uh, uh, change in the, uh, in the whole system uh, from 1985 to late 1990s. So here you can see some of the pictures that um, shows this transition. Uh, the, on, top, uh, on the top left is the old picture of the uh, Zhongguancun area in, in Beijing. So it's, um, you, know, you can see it's a, it's a very uh, uh, a rural area and the type uh, 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 of uh, environment. But on the right is the current uh, uh, Zhongguancun area. You can see it's a major transformation. On the le bottom left is also, it's, it's the headquarter of legend company. Uh, the, that's how, you know, when they started, you know, they, uh, um, that's, that's the headquarter. But now I think you can see on the uh, bottom right is the, the new headquarter. So I think that's sort of the transition we've seen uh, over the last uh, 40 years. So I think the, um, after the reform, I think there was a major change in the uh, attitude in the culture of the uh, academic research institutes. However, I think that um, the, um, many of these uh, changes have also um, happened uh, without, uh, you know, sort of in, the, in a way, sort of uh, the, the, the future prospects clear. For example, many basic research institutes, they are, they are concerned what, uh, uh, you know, what their role in the economic development. Uh, it's, it's not you know, they're best, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they are not best to suit it to, um, to serve the economic development because they are doing the basic research. And also, I think the emergence of a global knowledge economy has also shown the, uh, the new trend that uh, knowledge becomes a, a valuable asset for economic development. So I think these, there's a new uh, direction that's needed for the uh, next stage of China's s and reform. So here I think that uh, in 1998, uh, the uh, government began a, another new set of the, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of reform strategies to really uh, uh, reshape China's innovation system. This wave of reform was started by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, which actually submitted a report to the government, uh, basically uh, saying that they are the uh, a, a knowledge innovation uh, uh, institution that actually they should focus on their research and the government should provide the funding. And so I think actually the government uh, supported their uh, 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 position and you know, supported them with the block funding, uh, again, um, to support their research. And also China also began to reform public research in institutes, pushing them to the market, particularly those applied uh, public research institutes and also expanded higher education and started the world-class uh, university program. Also, I think that there are so many policies to promote R&D centers in SOEs and multinational centers in China. So basically, it's really all front to um, uh, really support China's uh, innovation uh, system. So I think this second wave of reform really, I think, focused on not just the public research institutes, but also on universities and also uh, companies. The third wave of change really started in uh, early 2000. And here I think there's uh, already a clear sign that uh, uh, China needs to change its overall development strategy from just focus on uh, GDP growth to a more coordinated development, uh, so-called scientific development approach. Also, 
uh, there's a need to, um, to respond to the global uh, challenges after China's entry to WTO. I think the strategies that uh, China began to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, you know, to, to set up a, a, a medium and long range S&T plan uh, in which indigenous innovation is uh, the, the focus. But so promoting indigenous innovation and the work to make China as a innovation basic country in 2020 was the goal uh, that's uh, proposed at the time. So China set up many priorities in basic and applied research and, and also a whole set of policy to promote industrial R&D. So the third wave of change is really making the, the, the development plan in innovation system. The latest one is the fourth wave. And the background of this is that economic growth is slowing down, international competition becomes stronger, and also there's uh, in increasing you know, evidence that the institutional deficiencies and distortions in the innovation system must be addressed. So the, the st strategy here is um, to promote innovation-driven development. So first of all, I think the government launched a set of reform to uh, change the management of national R&D programs, consolidating them into five platforms, and also to stimulate massive innovation and entrepreneurship. And also, I think, to, to propose that the, the entire development of the economy should really be based on innovation. So the fourth wave of, um, uh, 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 you know, sort of the change uh, is the one that's still continuing at the moment. So I think that's sort of the, I gave out sort of a very quick review of the evolution of the China's innovation system. So from the, uh, the uh, very uh, beginning of the end of the Cultural Revolution to the, uh, a few reforms that uh, in the mid-1980s, 90s, and 2000 until now. So I think that's sort of the, uh, the, those reforms and openness really allowed China's uh, innovation system to flourish. So now let's look at the outcome of the reform. First of all, let's see what are the major successes. Uh, first of all, I think China has experienced a sustained growth in total R&D investment. Uh, from mid-1990s to now, I think China's uh, um, R&D, uh, in the China's investment in R&D, you can see that um, the red line is China. So you can see that has been growing uh, continuously and now surpassing uh, every other countries except the US. US is the top one, still the highest. Uh, but you can see that China's growth is very steady and, and su is surpassing all other countries. And uh, also, I think China's, uh, in China's R&D uh, investment, uh, in industrial R&D has become a major part. Uh, in the uh, mid-1980s, it's only about one third, so meaning a lot of the research is done in research institutes, universities. But now I think it's uh, uh, more, than, uh, uh, more than three quarters are done by the industry. That's really showing that the, you know, the, it, it becomes more directly linked to the economic uh, growth. And also I think there's a rapid econ uh, growth in R&D outputs in, in terms of papers, patents, and also there's greater participation in the global innovation system in terms of multinational R&D centers, joint publications, and et cetera. And also, the higher education has also experienced a massive expansion. The growth in enrollment rate increased from 3.7 in 1990 to now uh, close to uh, half, to 50% in, uh, in uh, last year. Uh, the emergence of globally known institutions have also grown in terms of research universities, uh, research institutions, and multinational Chinese multinational companies. So those are some of the the, you know, the kind of uh, 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 indicators of China's, uh, uh, you know, success in innovation uh, domain. So let me uh, present some of the data, as you can see. So this is the one that I've already shown, the investment in R&D uh, uh, in comparison with other countries. And this is R&D intensity, meaning the R&D investment as percentage of GDP. Uh, China is now on par with um, European countries, Euro with uh, uh, European Union countries. So uh, it's just you know, over 2%. This is the China's international publication. As you can see that uh, 
I'm, I'm showing a sort of, you know, a, an earlier period of time uh, in 1999, from 1999 to 2008. You can see that around the year 2006 or 2007, uh, China's international publication have surpassed uh, all other countries ex except the U.S. So U.S. is not shown here. So you can see that China is really catching up very quickly. And uh, of course, I think some people say that indeed, uh, you know, the, while the number has increased, maybe the quality has not uh, uh, caught up yet. Uh, indeed, I think that uh, uh, in a co-author uh, and myself, we did a study on China's publication in high-quality journal uh, papers. And so we, uh, you know, we see how, in terms of how China is doing in terms of high-quality journal uh, publications. So here's what we found. Again, we see the same similar pattern that China has been catching up you know, since mid-1990s, uh, uh, catching up very quickly. Uh, now surpassing, uh, you know, in about 2011 or 12, surpassing all our, our other countries except the U.S. The U.S. is not shown here. So China is indeed, in terms of quality, has also increased quite rapidly. Okay. Uh, the, another indicator, of course, is the patent, as I mentioned before. And here is the, uh, the uh, uh, WIPO's data on the, uh, you know, the, the patents granted. In, in different offices. You can see China is the one that's being sort of grown fattest. You know, this is now, it's the, the most, uh, pat, you know, granted the most uh, patents uh, among the five major offices. And of course, many of this uh, uh, outcome were achieved with uh, international collaborations. As you can see that um, in terms of China's the international publications, it's, Oh, it's about 20% or so of China's total publica publication. And here you can see that um, the joint publication with U.S. is the blue bar is the highest, and uh, the green bar is with Japan, and others with European countries and with Russia. So you can see that many of these publications were uh, joint efforts. And also the uh, multinational R&D centers in China has also grown very fast. I think that uh, started in late uh, uh, 1990s, uh, you know, you can see that by 2010, it's already, uh, you know, 1,400. So I think the, uh, they contributed to the China's innovation uh, system uh, in a very dramatic way. Another thing that also is, is fascinating is the um, royalty payment. That is means, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, the sort of the, the intellectual property rights you know, you, you, you purchase to, uh, to use in your, your company's use. As you can see that this, again, is the, the you know, the, the top one, I, I guess uh, you probably were all guessed, you know, this is the U.S. So U.S., despite the U.S. is very strong, but still that U.S. is uh, really also buying a lot of technology from other countries. And I think the, this one is China. You can see catching up quickly and so now China is the second, uh, uh, you know, uh, highest, uh, you know, country in terms of royalty payment. So, um, yeah, and the, the green, bar, green line is Japan. Japan used to be the second, and now China is the second. So in a way, a lot of the technologies being used in China, I think actually are indeed going through this international, uh, 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 you know, sort of technology market. And of course, these are the global institutions we, we've talked about. However, I think despite all these progresses, uh, there are also uh, some regrets I think that um, uh, I uh, uh, you know, should not uh, miss. And the first is major regrets is in basic research. Uh, indeed, as I think that I've shown that Chinese publications have increased very rapidly. Uh, but in terms of quality, indeed, has uh, um, indeed yet to catch up. As I've shown you, actually, the uh, the bottom half of the picture in the previous one, if, if you see this one, yeah, this is the one. Yeah, this is a picture I've shown you that to see the catch up uh, of in high quality journals. However, this is only half of the picture. Yeah, the, the, the whole picture is here. So U.S. is up here. So meaning that the, uh, in, in terms of high quality publications, U.S. is really way ahead of many, many other countries. So I think you know, China is still uh, you know, here. 
So I think there's a, uh, uh, quite uh, a, a gap. So I think that uh, in terms of uh, uh, basic research, uh, high quality research, there's still uh, a lot of uh, effort need to be, uh, to be made. The other is on, in, on the innovation side, on the more application uh, commercialization side. Uh, there are still quite some innovation gaps with global leaders in critical technology areas. So China is still uh, actually dependent on the uh, international market to get those technologies or products. So one example is the uh, IC industry. You can see that in IC industry, uh, this is a China's uh, total IC uh, Im imports. So China every year spends sort of, you know, uh, millions and billions of dollars to, to buy those uh, uh, IC chips. And of course, China also has some uh, exports. The green bar is the, is the export. But the red bar are the, the deficit in IC industry. So China, while in, overall China enjoys a, a high trade um, uh, surplus overall in, in Chinese economy, but in IC industry, China ha actually has a a huge deficit in, in IC industry. So that's sort of the, the dependent on, on the foreign technology and products. And also I think that um, uh, while China has accumulated very strong manufacturing capabilities, but, that, but China has not built very strong brands. So I think that uh, we, while China has manufactured a lot of goods in, you know, in the world, but in terms of well-known brands, Globally, I think it's still limited. And also the overall productivity of the Chinese economy is still re relatively low, for example, in the, you know, uh, lagging behind uh, quite some uh, G20 countries. And also I think there's a lot of uh, um, still institutional reforms need to be completed in China if it really wants to be an uh, innovative country uh, uh, in, in, in China. So I think that's the set of you know, the things that we still yet to, uh, to complete. So uh, that's sort of the, I'm giving you the evolution and the outcome. Let me make a brief assessment of China's innovation systems and to what are the reasons for China's success and what need to be further improved. I think that, uh, you know, for people who do not, uh, you know, uh, who are not familiar with the China's innovation system, they do see the uh, sudden rise of China's innovation system as a surprise. But if you look at the, you know, what has evolved over the last 40 years or even 120 years, you will begin to understand why China began to, uh, you know, Chinese innovations began to emerge. I think the first one is the accumulation of capabilities and talents. Uh, I, I think uh, unlike many other developing countries, China has built its STI capabilities since 1895. So this, despite the, you know, the turmoils, you know, wars and so on, but China continued. So that actually uh, laid a very solid foundation for China's innovation systems. The second uh, uh, major reason is consistent policy support and conducive social environment. Uh, there's, uh, you know, innovation has always has very strong leadership support. Uh, so China's investment in you know, R&D has uh, you know, kept rising uh, since mid-1990s. And also the policy orientation is also very consistent. It's market-based reform, uh, competitive mechanisms, open and indigenous innovation, and that sort of you know, policy has been continued. And the third is very conducive social environment. Uh, the macro social environment of reform and the openness allowed many reforms to, to take place. One example is the you know, reform of over 1,000 uh, 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 you know, application-oriented uh, public research institutes, corporatizing them into uh, uh, in market entities, uh, it, it's uh, you know unlikely uh, to happen in other during other period of time, but you know during the economic ref the reform and openness period of time, those reforms are uh, indeed possible. The third is coordinated opening up and reform, serving as dual engines for development. So in a way, I think Chinese you know innovation system reform. It was really, uh, you know, moving along two wells. The first well is reform. Uh, those reform are based on incentives, uh, incentive change, and institutional change. So I think that's sort of the on the one wheel. The other wheel is opening up. It's learning from outside and trying to be integrated with the global 
uh, innovation systems. Uh, so for example, you know, the idea of science parks, uh, multinational R&D labs are all indeed ways to, uh, to be integrated into, into the global system. And the good thing is also these two wheels are really reinforcing each other. Uh, when you have better reform, that provides more opportunities for opening up. But when you have more opening up, that creates more demand for reform. So those two really uh, are really sort of reinforcing uh, each other. The last one, but the last one, but, but not least one, is the hard work spirit by a whole generation of people who treasured the opportunity to use their talent for the benefit of society. And so in a way, this is a, the first time in China's recent history to have a long, stable period of time for innovation, for social and economic development. So I think this, this whole generation of people that really uh, treasured those opportunities and worked extremely hard. So those, all of those factors really propel the, uh, the, uh, the emergence of China's innovation system. But of course, I think, as I mentioned, there are many, many, many uh, new things uh, needs, needs to be, uh, uh, reforms need to be, uh, to be done, to be, uh, to be uh, completed. For example, there's a need for a better market environment to support innovation, because I think ultimately, I think the innovation would have to be realized in the market, and so we need a fair and uh, you know, a competitive market. And also, there's a need to, for, for more risk-taking in China's basic research, because if you want to do those kind of a original uh, 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 research, the high quality research, there's also a lot of risks associated with it. Uh, so I think that uh, there's need to, uh, for Chinese scientists to be willing and daring to, um, to tackle those, uh, those uh, you know, sort of more of, uh, uh, original problems. And the third is that there's a need for stronger enforcement of academic integrity. Because we, we see in the rapid, uh, 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 you know, so growth in the rapid expansion of Chinese academic research, there's also some people who were really, you know, uh, uh, you know there, there are some misbehaviors uh, that, uh, you know, in, in terms of plagiarism, in terms of the misconduct, and so there's a need to be a very strong enforcement of disciplines and, uh, uh, you know, academic uh, integrity to curb those mis uh, misconduct. And also, I think there's also a need for better management of R&D institutions. Uh, to really align mission, operations, models, and the governance. Because now we have many R&D public research institutions. Uh, uh, they are, you know, they are assumed to play the role of public institutions, but the funding support is not aligned with their uh, mission. So many of those issues need to be addressed. Also, there's a need to have um, more autonomy to universities so that each university can position themselves to see how they can feed the need of the social demand, and to also to find their own way to achieve excellence. And finally, also, we need to uh, uh, make you know, a, a strong effort to cultivate innovative culture, because that ultimately uh, is the, uh, the, the source of innovation, so that we can allow more Jack Ma and you know, Musk type of people to emerge uh, from, the, uh, uh, you know, from China. So m those are just a, a a, a, you know, a few items that actually, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, listed here, but I've, of course, there's a lot more that can be done. Now, finally, let me get to the future prospects. Uh, I think given China's progress and its potentials, China's innovation system is poised to make much greater contribution to the global community. Uh, you can see that, you know, China's contribution to the global knowledge system has already been growing very fast. Now it's, you know, over... Uh, the total publication is on par with the U.S. Uh, China's contribution uh, to address global challenge, such as climate change, is also uh, uh, quite remarkable. So I think the potential is there. However, this potential has been dampened by the recent effort by the U.S. government to decouple with Chinese innovation areas. Uh, you know, since uh, 2017, uh, there's a whole set of measures that are uh, listed here uh, that uh, you know that's been taken by the U.S. government. This is really unfortunate. Uh, it has generated quite, quite a huge negative impact on global innovation system uh, in terms of knowledge production. I think that uh, the, there's a very strong U.S.-China collaboration in, 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 in almost every area. So I've, here I've done you know, some areas. You can see that this is in, in medical science. I think uh, on the left side is the, uh, the publication uh, in, uh, at the U.S., and this is the U.S. and this is China. 
And here it's interesting, it's the uh, joint publication as percentage of those countries. So here's the uh, joint publication as percent of the U.S. is about you know 14 or 48 percent of the U.S. side. On the China side, it's you know about 10 percent of China, uh, China total publication. And here is the in uh, WE, uh, which is an important area. Uh, this is the Chinese publication, and this is the U.S. publication. As you can see, that the joint publication is a very significant part of the U.S. Uh, uh, total publication but you know, one third of China's total publication. And here's AI, again, you, know, you, you see that, that uh, indeed uh, all of this uh, uh, joint work is quite important to both countries. However, with the, uh, you know, the, the current effort by the US government, this uh, joint, pub, uh, joint work may no longer uh, be possible. On the global innovation side, of course, I think delaying the diffusion of new products and services such as 5G and increasing the cost of uh, production and c consumption, uh, damaging global value chain. Ultimately, the, you know, everyone, uh, you know, I think in the, in the world would have to bear those costs. So it's a lot, you know, it, it's a lose-lose situation for the entire world. So what can be done? So here is a list of things that I propose that we, first of all, we should really try to maintain educational exchange, maintain exchange collaboration in basic science, because I think ultimately, Whatever being produced in basic science is, is good for, every, for everyone. And also, we need to establish a platform to address dispute in innovation areas. And here's, you know, there's, I understand there's commercial interest involved, but here I think uh, US-China has had, you know, experience before, in the so-called US-China innovation dialogue. That kind of platform would be very useful to address some of these disputes. And also identify areas of common interest to work together to address the common global challenges, such as public health, environment, climate change, and, and many other things. Imagine what can be achieved if US-China can join hands to tackle the most challenging issues of our time. So thank you. Let me stop here. <laughs>